Gare Maxwell, category of one brand building secrets, excuse me. Dive deep into the world of brand strategy with Gare Maxwell and his best selling book, Big Little Legends. I'm so excited to bring him here to you today. Discover transformative insights and untold secrets that could turn your organization into a unique category of one. Have you ever wondered how phenomena like the Taylor Swift and Mona Lisa effect influence brand recognition? Maxwell reveals it all. Intrigued? Tune in, because this is an eye-opening journey that could revolutionize your brand-building perspective. Welcome to the Wellness Driven Life Show, where you're about to go on a wellness-driven ride. Let me share with you a little bit more about our guest we have here today. Gare Maxwell is a renowned author, keynote speaker, and brand strategist known for his unique, impactful ideas that had led companies to exponential growth. He has received accolades such as Speaker of the Year from TEC Canada and being named a Vistage Top Performer. Gare is a dynamic speaker who has worked with globally recognized organizations and shared stages with business icons. He has over 700 appearances with notable groups such as TEC, might be tech, and Vistage International. Gare is also the best-selling author of the book, Big Little Legends, and hosts the podcast, The Leadership Standard. He had a successful career in broadcasting journalism before transitioning into his current role. Gare, a lifelong amateur historian and music lover, resides in Alberta, Canada with his family and pets. Please help me welcome Mr. Gare Maxwell. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, April. And somewhere my mother, God rest her soul, is beaming with pride. Uh, appreciate the invitation and uh, looking forward to digging into this topic, which uh, I, I'm sad to report we only have, what, an hour or so to discuss this? Yeah. And, you know, we, we're we going to be jam-packed with it. I know it. you have so much information. We found your advertisement, so to speak, on YouTube, but the way that you created it was so beautiful, so engaging, so enticing. And so the topic itself is definitely going to be incredible. And I would like to start out for the audience's sake, let's share with them just a little bit more about your background. Let's share who you are. Well, uh, I am, as you mentioned, a recovering broadcast journalist, uh, did 20 years of radio and TV, and uh, transitioned into a first soft skills business training and stumbled onto this topic more than anything, April, by complete accident. Um, chapter two uh, cap in the book captures the accident that occurred, and, and basically we discovered something with a very small business. Uh, back where I'm from in New Brunswick, Canada, that propelled it from like a million dollar business to a $50 million business from five employees to 38. It, it's, it was just phenomenal growth and, and, and really established this one company as a, as you mentioned in your intro, a category of one. So we're here now uh, west of Calgary, Alberta. We're in a little town, about 30,000. We're nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And for those dog lovers out there, we've got three mm -hmm. under this roof. Uh, one of them happens to be in the studio right now as I speak. So uh, uh, two Cocker Spaniels and a Beagle Mix Rescue. And uh, we really enjoy the outdoor life out here in, in, the, in, in the shadows of the Rockies. Well, I appreciate that very much because I, too, 
really grew up in those Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So just a little bit of distance there. But and of course, we have animal lovers here on the show. So that's exciting. I am so impressed with your broadcasting career. And I was from the get go when I read it in your intro, Gare. And so you, you really have gone into this media relations avenue. And when we talk about falling upon a the, this business that has really had this exponential change and growth, you start to wonder, well, what are the things that make it different? What differentiates it from the rest of the pack, right? And mm -hmm. it's it's very, very interesting because I, I think that you really came into this by being that history buff where you've seen the magical essence of historical factors creating certain things and certain trends. Yeah, well, actually, that's a that's a good point because what I actually focus on are the things that aren't going to change. And history reveals certain things that will never, ever, ever change. So for anyone watching or listening, and by the way, can people write in with their comments? They can. They can perfect. Because this Absolutely. is a time. for anyone watching or listening, like just jump in with your comments right away about the things that won't change. And I love that when you said we don't rehearse the show, we don't have any scripted questions, here's proof positive. April, finish the statement for me. Ready? Just finish the statement. Okay. For a thousand years from now, actions will always speak louder than... Words. Done. That's not going to change. Uh, let me see. You never get a second chance to make a first... Impression. Never going to change. Uh, yeah. Perception will always be... Reality. Reality. Okay. Right? Yeah. Jeff Bezos, and we'll give people, folks, time. Let's see if uh, our audience can chip in with a few other helpers, if you will, on the things that won't change. Humans will always want to connect with other humans. Yeah. That's not going to change. Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos built his little company on the things that won't change. You know what Jeff figured out? He figured out that customers will always want lower prices, more selection, and speedier delivery. Hmm. And when you I hope everyone's about, taking notes. I think when you think about how Amazon exploded, yeah. it's built on a foundation of things that won't change. So yeah. essentially, Big Little Legends is built the same way. What's not going to change? Because if you know the things that will never, ever change, I think it places you in a much better position to handle things that are changing, like technology, like the explosion of AI, for example. So what's it going to be next year? Does anyone know? Could be something completely new. There's definitely an explosion of AI. I would hands down agree with you there. And it does look like we had a, a comment that came in. He said, taxes. <laughs> yeah, right. Death and taxes, right? These are the things that will never change. Uh, here, here, I'll throw another one. If you always settle for ordinary, you will never discover extraordinary. Yeah. Right? And, and there, without ambiguity, there is no discovery. So I know in my speaking programs, in the beginning, there's a little bit of ambiguity as people start to latch on to some of these salient points that will never, ever, ever change. And so when when I get invited to speak on Big Little Legends, I always start with the, to me, to me which is the obvious question. Uh, what is the most famous painting in the world? The Mona Lisa. Bingo. But why? Yeah. But Why? That's the question. Why did she, and this is what happens, April, with every audience, and it doesn't matter whether it's 15 people or 1,500, 99% of the room knows it's the Mona Lisa that has that undisputed top of mind awareness. And I, that's what I want to challenge. Well, how did she get anointed as that undisputed queen? Why is she renting prime shelf space in your brain? Hmm. And to take the, the metaphor of the Mona Lisa even further. So here, here we are, what, another day? Another 30,000 visitors have just paid $40 a head 
to wander through that museum called the Louvre and 99% eager to see only one painting. And at any one time, there are 35,000 other paintings, objects, artifacts on display. So why does one product draw a crowd while others, even if judged to be of superior quality, are completely overlooked and ignored? Why? You know, um, and and I'm so excited to talk about this because I actually didn't know a lot about this. And of course, researching a little bit more, and as of course have you, you've done that, but from what I understand is it's her eyes as you walk around the painting always seem to be that, that fixed gaze on you. No. And then, right. and then you always see the, the eyes moving, which maybe makes sense, right? That's, that's not what, it. Shaking that's your what, head. That's what people want to believe. Oh, okay. And that's what they've been told. Like what you just demonstrated is the power of the story that after a while, becomes a myth and then it becomes a legend and no one can separate the reason why, the real reason why. Mm. Because there was a time when she was not the most famous painting in the world. And we've used the Mona Lisa as the metaphorical example of how anyone can create the irresistible brand. And that's really what we're talking about. How do you make the market come to you because so it's this, not necessarily that it is it's it's not put it this way it's certainly not the biggest nor most majestic painting in the building it's a 30 by 21 portrait right yeah and and so how about we do this how about we tease the audience a little bit as to the real reason why she's the most famous but we can document it right to the day when she was suddenly elevated into that status. But it was on my last trip to the Louvre a number of years ago where I sat and studied that and I realized the museum itself was a metaphor for the open market. So how many paintings are there? Well, there's 35,000 paintings. Well, you're in DFW, for example. How, how many wealth management firms are there in DFW, April? Oh, countless, my goodness. Right. How many realtors? Again, countless. Right. How many car dealerships? How many insurance companies? I, we, can, You and I can go up and down the list, right? And we will see these overcrowded, overcompetitive categories all trying to jostle and fight for market position to own that prime shelf space, as, as we talked about. And, and that's what, for our purposes, that's what that painting in Paris serves as it's well, that's the metaphorical example that is universal. And once people get over the really come to terms with the universality of this, they will see it really doesn't matter whether it's a product, a place, a person, um, an object, an event. Well, you mentioned it in your in your run up. Why did the NFL ratings for Kansas City Chief games suddenly spike? Right? Why? Over the last several weeks. This is in the news right now. Why? It has nothing to do with the football, nothing to do whether they're winning or losing, but everything to do with one person. One person. <laughs> so, so, so you're telling me as soon yeah. as Taylor Swift shows up, the ratings spike? Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. And I would love to know what is the correlation between Mona Lisa effect and now what you're calling the Taylor Swift effect as well. Which to me, you, you've zeroed in on how a hundred years apart, it's the same dynamic. Mm. It's absolutely the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's, what was it the sales of tra uh, Travis Kelsey, his jerseys, his jersey sales have skyrocketed, skyrocketed yeah. like what 400 percent or something right so when yeah. these when these stories begin to break we look at it from our research and our experience april and we just say well yeah that's the mona lisa effect playing itself out yet again and again and again uh i think there was about five million dollars worth of sales in three days for a pair of sunglasses worn by a certain U.S. college football coach out in Colorado. 
he, he gets into a media dust up with a rival coach and suddenly prime sunglasses from Deion Sanders are through the roof in sales. Um, mm. Real estate prices in Montana. A have you heard? We're talking 50, oh. 60, 70% increases. Oh, yeah. In property values in Montana. Yeah. And, and it still comes back to the same reason. And here it is. August 21st, 1911. The Mona Lisa was stolen. When she was stolen, nobody knew. In fact, it was 48 hours before the officials at the Louvre even knew she was gone. So don't tell me she was always the most famous painting in the world. She clearly wasn't. But when she was stolen, she attracted uh, obviously a police investigation um, but millions and millions and millions of dollars of front page publicity, not just in Paris, but all over the world, from Pittsburgh to Pensacola, Florida. This goes on for two years. There's, believe it or not, in 1911, there were conspiracy theories. Uh, the chief of police resigned in disgrace. It was a national scandal. What was the only mass media back in 1911, 1912, 1930? It's the newspaper. Radio mm. hasn't even been invented yet. So sh this is a global story that went viral. And when she came back, when she was finally returned, 120,000 people are there to greet her upon her arrival. She came back, she left as a nobody and came back as a rock star. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a, there's a sense of media there. I right, and, and what it is, when you really strip it down, it's it's this. Art without a story is just paint on a canvas. Mm. A business yeah. without a story is just like every other business. Yeah. So the story happened to the Mona Lisa. It happened to her, right? Yeah. She got lucky. There's a guy selling soup in Manhattan in November of 1995. Got real lucky too. The story happened. Yeah. So from a business leadership point of view, the story either happens to you or you've got to make one happen. Somehow okay. you've got to create a story because you can't create the legend without a story. That makes a lot of sense. And it's fitting for this comment to come in regarding Taylor Swift. If they break up, that's a number one song. I'd exactly. say that's just another story. Well, and that will add more fuel to the fire. More, yeah. In other words, whatever spark and a flame is happening there, and a shout out to our, our eagle-eyed observer, but you want to throw more gasoline on that if you can. So don't, if they go splitsville, don't be surprised if Taylor comes back with another tune. So Gary, I have a, I have a great question. Sure. What would you say that, that any media is great exposure, regardless whether it's viewed as good or bad. Uh, there was a time years ago I would have agreed with you about the good or bad part. Let's break it down this way. Let's break it down into digestible bites. Number one, the choice of media is not the deciding factor. It's the actual message. So always think in terms of what's the message, mm -hmm. what's the story. Is there inherent drama? You know, no one's going to share or get all, shall we say, emotionally invested into typical sales and marketing language around product, service, features, advantages, benefits. Right? Like no one shares that stuff. So there's a big difference between what I call a sales organization and a brand. So it all starts with the story. It all starts with the message. What is the story? After that, the choice of media, that I, I think more and more has become that which is video-based because of the world we're living in. I mean, I'm, I like blogs as much as anyone. I like podcasts. I do a lot of them. I've hosted them. Um, that being said, the good or bad part that you brought up, let's frame it this way, April. Attention equals currency. And I remember speaking 
to an audience. I remember exactly the day, the moment. I, I, I have this in my program. Attention equals currency. If a business or a mm. brand fails to acquire attention, it's going to die. So currency, it's not, and it's not just monetary. It's it's relationship currency. It's social currency. It's reputational right. equity. It goes on and on and on, right? Attention equals currency. So you've got to get attention. We we all live and compete in the attention economy. Yeah. But this one gal in Wisconsin out of the audience said it's positive attention equals positive currency. Mm, good point. Because. Very powerful. A, yeah, because there's a certain American beer that found out, and we're not even going to mention the name because we don't have to. Well, I'll they know. That negative attention equals negative currency. Mm. And mm. I don't think the people listening to this show have an army of lawyers and deep reservoirs of cash to fight those fights should they wade into those very uh, shark-infested waters, put it that way. Yeah. Well, I can certainly say that I would want positive currency. So it makes a lot of sense to me to to want right. to have that that great stuff. You know, when we talk about energy for instance, you know, that's that's exactly what it is. What kind of energy do you want to be bringing in to yourself and your business? And you know, we can go even deeper than that. What kind of stress do you want in your life? And I feel that the more stress that we add on, we really can't perform and make our businesses great regardless. So I think that's a very, very good statement that you had there that the positive currency creates, or sorry, the positive, uh, what did you, how did you say it? Media yeah, creates positive yeah, currency anyway. Yeah, positive attention equals positive attention. currency. And, and so one of the yeah. things that I noticed just on your video, and by the way, folks, we have not rehearsed this. So this is totally us just shooting from the hip off the cuff. But I saw your little intro video that rolled. And I seized on one word because I, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to process and see, well, what are the connections here? And there was one word I thought that was particularly illuminating. It's when the word organic came up. Mm. And when I, when I saw the title of the show, Wellness Driven, and I saw organic, I thought to myself, you know, I wonder how many people struggle with the identity issue, trying to be something they're not. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, I'm curious to know from you is, has there been any past guests who have spoken to that of, of the incredible personal stress on trying to basically live the lie? Oh, well, you know, Gary, I always work to bring my guests to a point of, of really being vulnerable and sharing themselves. Right. And in that, I think that we've had a few that go there, but it is a rare thing indeed. I mean, even people who are out there sharing their stories, it is a rare thing to go pretty deep in that. I do like to bring up identity crisis a lot because I myself, as I think most people have gone through an identity crisis or shift of some sort, I like to uh, liken it to uh, grief. I think that grief can be said on so many different aspects where it's not necessarily the loss of a loved one. It can be the grief of job loss or the grief of, of disease or list a number of things, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to say that identity crisis can be stemmed from numerous different things too. But identity is something that is, is very, very powerful because we all have a sense of identity. We all feel like we need to be something or someone, especially when we consider uh, societal standards and how we grow up and what we think that people will accept of us because we all just want to be accepted. Right. And see this, you've touched on a nerve here that we've discovered in our research and our work with organizations. Brand speaks to that, which is, uh, it's all about identity, reputation, and perception. That is brand. Right. So every time here, here, I'll show you something right out of our workshops that we do. Every time Apple releases a brand new phone, what do they do? Do people line up? Hell yeah. Yep. Don't they? They I'm trying up. to get one too, Gare. 
So <laughs> literally line up around the block, down the street. This phenomena happens all over the world when the new phone comes out. Okay, and it's been that that dynamic's been happening for a while. So when you stop and look at it and say, well, what's the difference between the lineups for the phone or the lineups for, um, you know, that one particular painting in Paris? It's still humans lining up. Why? What happened? So okay. they, the extreme, they will pitch a tent camp out in the rain for the latest Apple product. But when was the last time anyone pitched a tent camped out in the rain uh, for the latest product from Acer? So I'm thinking, and this is the direction that, that my brain goes, but you have yeah. to have that emotional connection, the emotional aspect. Bingo. Yes, comes, to connect with other which people comes, in your audience. Which come, yeah, which is all built on identity. Without identity, you're just another one of the 48,000 realtors in Toronto. Mm. Or in Chicago, how many lawyers are there in Chicago? Well, we can tell you there's 45,210 in Cook County, Illinois. Right? You can go through every single category and chart the number. Right. Yeah. So so when people reach out to us, it's always around. That's that's what makes them curious. It's, well, how do we build an identity that is organic, that's truly ours, that's truly one of a kind? We never had to manipulate, falsify. We're not adding some marketing manipulation. We're just being who we really are. And when I say the story either happens to you or you've got to make one happen. Yeah. It it comes from this place of uh, of of deep seated conviction that this is yeah. actually who you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I would also like to say and play on that that it makes everything so much easier. You're not you're not fighting anything because right. it's authentic and it is you. And you're just you're kind right. of turning from the the inside out and and showing the world who you are, what you are, and what you have to yeah. offer the value. Well, and doing it without apology. So quick story to illustrate the point is, um, and we have a, we've been very fortunate. We have a number of these stories and this is one that's not in the book. Okay. I like that. Yeah. But this is one that's been just growing like literally month by month. It's, 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 it's the marketing snowball that, that has turned into an avalanche. Okay. Okay. So in January of 2018, I meet a guy named B.J. Wurzen, and B.J. is the CEO of a little company out of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. So Mechanicsburg is famous, of course, for being home to three quarters of the original members of the rock band Poison. But I digress. Well, I, I like Poison. <laughs> well, well, every rose has its thorn, right? <laughs> uh, and and, and we're, we're, we're in here for nothing but a good time. That being said, BJ works in an unglamorous, unsexy industry. And he's got, at the time, April, he's got about 130 employees. They're doing about 35 to 40 million in revenue. So by many measures, the guy's doing very, very well. But he sits in the back of the room of a big little legends program and something really sparked his thinking around what you and I were just talking about, this identity, mm. right? What separates, and by, oh, by the way, they do bathrooms, doors, and windows. Okay. So think of how crowded that com that renovation category is. Yeah. is. All over America, people are doing bathrooms, doors, and window installation, right? So... He sits there and he really plugs into that word identity. Do we have an identity mm. that truly separates us from everybody else? Or are we just in the big category mosh pit? Where are we? Right. And so we worked with BJ and his team uh, at one of our leader, uh, at one of our executive boot camps. And the, the short story is this after you, put them through a number of extraction exercises, you get to the real heart of who they are. Now, just for background, he started in 2006 with a tool belt and a landline telephone 
and he's got a big soft spot for America's veterans and the military. Very patriotic guy. Hmm. And as we were doing these different extraction exercises, words came up like uh, aggressive, uh, robust, uh, uh, ferocity, tenacity. Like you, like you could tell. They, hmm, they had, were rough. They were. Yeah, they had some fire within them that way. Mm -hmm. long for, yeah, very, very. Okay. So their identity there. So the company's name is West Shore Home. Anyone can go look them up on YouTube. Um, and, and West Shore Home, I would describe here without pictures. It's, it's, a, it's like a military-centric organization. In other words, they are the home renovation answer to the Marine Corps meets the U.S. Navy SEALs. They are default aggressive. They have decentralized command. They take extreme ownership. They are on a mission to bring happiness to every home. So they really have embraced this idea, uh, April, of who they are, and they make no apologies for it, okay? And, and in doing so, they're turning away the employees they don't want, and they're attracting those, believe it or not, the brand has been built for those who want to push themselves to get better. There are mm. some people who are really like that. They just want to push themselves to get better every day. Great. Yeah. Rush your home's your place. That's, I want you to hear this more than, that's who they already were. I just stumbled onto it and we put it all together in a way that helped everyone internally on the leadership team recognize that's us. Don't yeah. blink. Things move fast around here. Great. And so when you look at their digital footprint and look how they've expanded on that. Yeah. It's fascinating to watch. As of right now, April, that's a billion dollar company. Hmm. They, you know, they have our... over, yeah, they have the numbers are staggering. They have over 3,000 employees. They've grown to 37 locations in 17 states. And on average, right now, they're getting 13,000 job applications a month. Wow. Like this is a juggernaut. That's that, amazing. That I, but, but what they did is they, fundamentally, they adopted this idea. They stepped into who they already were anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I think that there's so much to be said about your team and people really being on the same page and being passionate about who they're working with and employed with. It becomes a sense of self. And when we talk about identity, you identify with the company, with the vision. And so it becomes part of you. And you know, those people become your biggest advocates and they are so loyal and they just radiate with, with the passion for the company and you can't help but want to talk about it in this really high vibration state. I know that it was, it brought me so much more joy when I was working for companies that I really respected and I loved what they stood for. It meant so much and it brings this sense of, uh, what's the word I wanted to look for? Uh, you, you really are, I keep saying thinking passion, but that's not the word I'm looking for. You're, you're loyal and you, you have this honor about it. There's a, there's a bigger purpose. So yeah. for example, when you look at West Shore Homes YouTube channel, you will see a program. And for me, it's about ideas, ideas that start on flip charts through little workshop exercises. And the thrill is watching that flip chart paper turn into actionable, real life uh, examples of, of how thinking translated into that which is tangible. Well, just last week, I got the word that they just captured an Emmy Award for one of the videos they did honoring a 96-year-old veteran. They have a program called West Shore for Warriors. And what they do, April, is they go in with a crew and a truck and a bunch of materials for veterans who have fallen on hard times or fell through the social safety nets. And mm. they just take care of the guy. That's what they do. They yeah. step up and they just take care of those folks. And so they're really living out a purpose. And you, like you just described, there would have to be a certain percentage of the audience that also recognizes, hey, I can be involved in something much bigger than just putting up drywall and, and throwing in some tubs. Yeah. Right? 
Oh, I love when people get that bigger thinking. And there's so much magic involved when, you know, people start to realize as an entrepreneur in, in business, a business owner, when they start to think bigger and do bigger because they get to do bigger things and have a, a much larger impact in the world when they are creating and generating more wealth. And so I, I think for whatever reason, some people get this idea in their mind where, where they don't want to expand themselves and they aren't as creative, but, but the possibilities are so endless in how you can make impact. Yes. Well, how do I say this politely? Remember, I am a Canadian, right? So we're what, overly polite and, and, and we love our maple syrup and stuff like that. But I've never seen anyone create a legend who was a cynic, a skeptic, or a naysayer. Mm. I, I've, I've never seen that, right? I've isolated four qualities. So if people are really curious, that's one of them. This is really all about a leadership quest for those who are curious, courageous, with vision and initiative. Like that captures BJ Wurzen in a nutshell. He was curious. He's, he's a, a real quiet guy, but incredibly courageous with vision that extends far beyond the current horizon. Marketing has basically been stuck for the last 60, 70 years. And all the internet did was make it even more confusing for those that could not answer the ultimate marketing question. Who are you beyond your products and services? I've studied well over 8,000 websites. And that's just a reflection of strategic thinking. And you'll see that most people in small to mid-sized businesses build their marketing messages around their actual products and services. Well, when you start building it around something other than that, then you tap into what the legendary brands figured out a long time ago. So Apple has an identity, but so does Nike, yeah. right? So does Harley Davidson. So does Harvard. So Big Little Legends is the metaphor for the small to medium-sized companies that have also found a way to create an incredibly irresistible magnetic pull in the market. The idea is make the market come to you. You know, I, I just notice again, and we talked about it a little before, but it's so simply done. And I think that when you when you do release that identity aspect and that beauty of it, it it's not hard. It's it's something that is very it comes a lot more easier. Would you agree with that? Well, it's here's what it is. It's it's a, the language of brand itself is metaphorical, meaningful, emotional and symbolic. That's why they're lining up for the apple. Mm. that's why they line up for the painting. It's it, it's all the same. That's why West Shore Home is getting 13,000 job applications a month. One coffee shop in New Orleans is swamped with customers. All the others are ignored, right? One fish market in Seattle gets thousands of visitors every week. They ignore all the other fish markets. I could go on and on and on. That being said, this thing about identity, the perfect metaphor to think in terms of grand strategy would be cart before the horse. Everyone intuitively knows what the cart before the horse means, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the cart before the horse means, oh, our thinking is backwards. We got our priorities out of whack. Everything that would encapsulate about, oh, well over 98% of the way marketing is done right now. So we're going to give the horse a name, April. The horse has a name, Nike. That's the name. That's the identity. Okay. That horse has a name. You can see it. You can even see it in your mind. Yeah, the horse. Yeah, we're going to call the horse Nike, right? Yeah. What's the instant phrase you think of right away? When, when I say Nike, what's the first phrase that comes to mind? Just do it. Right. So let's do the same thing for another horse. You ready? Do the same thing. First th phrase that comes to mind, April. I told you we weren't going to rehearse this or make this up. <laughs> or, well, right? hopefully I get the answer right. Here we let's go. go. Ready? Here we go. In three, two, one, Reebok. I don't know it. Nobody knows. 
And that's my point. <laughs> well, I'm glad I, I, I didn't just embarrass myself there. Nobody knows. I can't find an audience anywhere that knows. That's a, that's a good point. So what you have is a, and it's not just Reebok. It's, I use it because it's an easy example and I'm not picking on them. It's not a diss on their products, their services, their culture. All the products are good. No one's arguing that. You know, it's like Apple's competitors, all it's the just products. A matter of fact. What's that? It's just a matter of fact. But, but yeah, everyone's got good products. Great. Who are you beyond the products and services? That's the key question. Nike figured that out. Mm. Reebok is the example of the company spending, in their case, millions of dollars a year on marketing to be known for nothing. So people mm. will spend, spend, spend. Wow. On the cart before the horse, but they're not, they don't have an identity. So it, look at it this way. The cart, sorry, the horse's identity, the cart is reputation. Once you have the identity figured out, then you build brand reputation and build reputational equity around that. But you've got to first have the identity clearly established. So when you do go to market, with your videos, your YouTube channel, your social media posts, your trade show booths and all the brochures and all the collateral and your your Facebook and your Instagram and your TikToks. You know what? You're those guys. Yeah. You know, Gare, so much of this reminds me of, of certain books that I've read. And Stephen Covey's really comes to mind, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of my favorite books. And, and Begin with the End in Mind sort of is, is coming yes. here. And also, he has so many beautiful stories and wisdom. And, and I'm so excited to read your book, by the way, because I know that you're going to have a lot of that, too. So we're going to make sure everyone knows where to find that. And so... But he has stories of how he has he went into businesses integrated, but he really brought in the the every single person that works for that business is going to play a part in creating the vision for what they stand for and who they are, the identity piece of it. And so they also they too identify with the company and what they stand for. And it just brings so much more uh of servitude to embodying that. And I want to talk a little bit about your book too, sure. but I want to go back to that. The reason I bring that up is because Gare, I would love to know who are the people who have really influenced you on this journey to come to all of this research and conclusions mm. about this subject? I, well, first of all, kudos to you. No one ever has figured out to this day, the connection between begin with the end in mind and what we just talked about with the cart before the horse. You're the first mm -hmm. to ever figure that oh. out. Yeah, no, that, like, like good on you. Uh, because that's essentially, it's saying the same thing, but different is what Stephen Covey said. And tell me Covey didn't have an identity and build a brand around the seven habits, right? He had a very clear message and he did it that way with a framework that was easy for people to understand, right? Uh, with respect to the book and people who've uh, had a huge impact, it, it all goes back to uh, the star of chapter two and the origin. Every legend cr was created somewhere, right? And in this case, Big Little Legends, uh, its birth uh, happened many, many years ago, 2002, actually. So what are we, over 20 years? Mm. 20 Gosh, yes. Yeah. So I met a guy named Jim and Jim and his wife, Donna, had this. They were small entrepreneurs. They had five employees, a part timer. They were doing about one point two, one point three million a year in revenue. And, and they were, you know, they were doing pretty good. But I, I spoke at a chamber of commerce function and Jim came up to me and just so you know, character wise, he's not the Navy SEALs meets the Marine Corps. OK, he's <laughs> the direct opposite. He's he's very soft spoken. All right. I want you to hear that and all your listeners to hear that. He's very soft spoken. OK. <laughs> and he approaches me about, you know, working together to grow his little business. All right. Here's what happens. 
He's in the worst category in the world for public perception and reputation. And we worked for four years before we stumbled on to what we're talking about now. Four years, and we don't even know what we're <laughs> wrapping our heads around. But we just, you know what? April, it felt right. It felt, mm. okay, intuitive. Uh, that's it a good thing right. to bring in too. Okay. That that's that's something not, that matters. So here's what happened. In September of 2006, we didn't change product, pricing, promotion. We weren't focused on all the things that people focus on in business, even today with analytics and KPIs and USPs and LMNOP. And we didn't do any of that. Okay. We focused on changing the story. Mm. Okay. We had no idea how powerful this story would become. And we would go on the radio and I did the spots and we would do these 30 second vignettes, little stories about Canada's huggable car dealer. Huggable car dealer. He's the Casanova of customer focus. He's <laughs> the Romeo of roadsters. By golly, he's been called the McDreamy of drive. I like it. So, <laughs> Within weeks, complete strangers are going out of their way to give Jim Gilbert a hug. Mm. Now, in what world? Wait a minute. How did he feel about that? Well, at, at, at first, he was a little taken aback, but then he realized, I'm glad you asked the question because it brings <laughs> me back to the night. We're six weeks in. We're having dinner, just the three of us, me and Jim and his wife, and Jim's his face, his face, I can still see us like he's 10 years old again. His eyeballs are just bulging because he's like, I've been on the radio for, for 20 years. No one's ever come up to me and talked to me about my ads. <laughs> we knew without knowing, we know we've got something. We've cut through the clutter. We've cut through the noise. We have an identity. We don't understand it at the intellectual level that we do now. Yeah, but it business, that business, here's what happened. They took the huggable concept and ran with it. So it became much more than radio ads. So if you go there today, the guy who was once on a little corner lot, you know, he's on 17 and a half acres of fabulous. He's got hundreds of teddy bears and mascots and merry-go-rounds and april there's a two kilometer nature trail to go walk your dog on the trail of hugs right that <laughs> became like a 50 million dollar business employing 38 people wow and so a lot of the theories around big little legends were tested at like i like to explain to people without benefit of pictures it's kind of like if walt disney dreamed up a used car lot this is it Nice. And it's in Fredericton, New Brunswick. <laughs> and so you've never heard of that story ever, right? But you right. can't create the legend. I, I said uh, there's two things I, I really want to emphasize to our viewers and our listeners. You can't create the legend first without a story. And you can't create the legend without venturing into the unknown. We had no guarantee of success. In other words... No risk, no reward, mm. right? No guts, no yeah. glory. No legend was ever created without some display of either physical or emotional courage. So did it take guts uh. to become Canada's huggable car dealer? Yes. Oh, it, it, uh, it but, hits a, a personal string for me too, Gare. I, you know, just, just, going live and doing this show, it just takes me back to, to before we made the decision to go live. And there's this sense of immense vulnerability that you have oh. to do. It's no. incredible. Well, and I congratulate you because the biggest thing is this imposter syndrome. In other words, yes. what is it that stops people from stepping into their own identity? It's they feel like the imposter, right? Yeah. You've got to get over that. That's your issue. That's why this is so much bigger than marketing or branding per se. This is about discovering wow. who you really are. And here's the thing. Jim and Donna are the nicest, kindest, 
most generous people you'll ever meet. Metaphorically, they're they're yeah. huggable, right? Yeah. So they don't fit the stereotype yeah. of that industry. <laughs> so let's embrace whatever magic they have. And yeah, they very much put it themselves out there. And, yes. you know, I, I would say that this is, this goes so much deeper, Gare. You know, when when people step into that vulnerability and are become this courageous person of doing this, it it meets us and and heals us on so many different levels, on a spiritual level as well. And so, I, I like to talk about that with people. I like to say, you know, when we start sharing our stories, as you're yeah. saying, that's the key thing, right? One mm -hmm. of them, we have to have the story to share of our brand identity. And, you know, when when we step out and we start sharing our story, we're not only he healing ourselves, but we're healing everybody else. And I think that's one of the attraction aspects is people are drawn to that authenticity. Yeah, it's it's sad that authenticity has become a bit buzzy lately, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But but you're right. They want to feel something real. They want to know it's yeah. genuine. They 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 can feel it in our conversation that you didn't have a bunch of prepared questions and you and I are just, you know, going with the flow, right? But that was that story of the huggable car dealer. Well, that inspired the West Shore home guy out in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, because he would have sat back in the room that day, saw that story, and went, wow, we can do the same thing but in our way, in our industry, right? Yeah. And and we, you know, quickly with that cart before the horse metaphor, and, and this is bigger, uh, and I, I, I've loved this conversation and where it's gone. This is so much bigger than business. It is so much bigger than just B2B and B2C and all the business and corporate speak that's, you know, ad nauseum out in the world today. We got the invitation from a small town in Western Canada to do this type of work. So think about an entire municipality. Think about what's at stake there. You've got a whole town looking to find an identity. So why would a city, small city in Western Canada, want to invest in a long-term brand strategy? Why would they want to do that? Well. I can think of three reasons, uh, mm -hmm. certainly tourism and economic development, but also civic pride to make people feel good about where they're living, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's part of the wellness component. And and so have you ever heard of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan? I haven't, but it sounds enticing. Okay. So other than the quirky name, nothing's really famous about Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And the facts will show you that it's a town of 33,000 and they don't have a global marketing budget, do they? There's no possible way they can get their message out there unless they've got a great story to tell. And so we got the invitation and we did the same thing. We, Whether it's West Shore Home or the city of Moose Jaw, you work in finding out, well, what is there really here? At the risk of sounding, I'm not a medical doctor or anything or a scientist, but I'm really looking for DNA. What's in the DNA of this place or this company? Or That's the only way I can kind of pinpoint it, right? Once once we dig enough and find that, yeah. then that becomes the core for what it's going to be in terms of positioning, strategy, all those things, okay? Yeah. At so, the heart, at the root of. Very, at the deepest level, yeah. right? Yeah. And so and so in the case of Moose Jaw, I remember uh, getting the invite to go there. It was September of 2018. The mayor shows me around town. I saw the first thing I saw that caught my eye was this cab company that I thought that's an odd name for a cab company. And then I saw a hideaway motel. And it's one of those motels. How do we be polite about this? April, it was, shall we say, on the real uh, economical side. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's best. Brings a, brings a certain 
sort of customer? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and not the discriminating kind, put it that way. Yeah. Um, okay, and then I see this big mural and I'm seeing these patterns. And then the pattern repeated itself when we did the executive boot camp. I kept hearing these different stories mm. dating back to the prohibition era. All right. Okay. So we, I file all this away and I think that's kind of interesting. Okay. So are you ready for it? I am. Okay. January of 2019, the mayor of Moose Jaw came out on YouTube and issued a declaration of war against Norway. What? Yes, you heard it right. Yes, you can look it up. A declaration of war. Why? There was a town in Norway. These nefarious Norwegians had the audacity to build a moose statue 30 centimeters higher than Mac the Moose. They stole his title for being the world's tallest moose statue. Are you hearing this, April, loud and clear? It reminds me a lot of Texas. Yeah, well, of course. Well, guess what? <laughs> guess what? The Norwegians and 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 the city of Moose Jaw got into this social media brush fire that that eventually attracted millions and millions and millions of eyeballs all over the world. Wow. They're on BBC Global with ninety million viewers. Uh, four minutes on the Colbert Report. Um, you know. Every day for about a three-week period, the mayor of Moose Jaw was doing 15 to 20 media interviews a day from the LA Times to the South China Morning Post. See, the brand is magnetically irresistible, right? Yeah. And you're asking, well, where does all this come from? Yeah. See, the Norwegians didn't know who they were messing with. Canada's most notorious city. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. you're the notorious city, you can't just turn the other cheek and say, no. oh, that's okay. You can have the title of the world's tallest moose. You got to lock horns, right? <laughs> you got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in Cold War II, okay? And and the happy ending is the mayor of, of in Norway came over to Canada in the spring of that year, and they had an international moose summit. They signed a moose truce with an I hope official. They, I, I hope they enjoyed a moose stroll together too. Oh, listen, they went all out. They became great friends. And uh, I know everyone loves the happy ending to the story. Mac the Moose underwent a successful antlerectomy and regained his title as the world's tallest moose statue. All right. But where does Canada's most notorious city? See, once you become yeah. notorious... And that speaks to differentiation. That speaks to category of one. April, how do all the municipalities market themselves? All of them. They're all friendly, welcoming, yeah. a great place to live, work, and play. Yeah, you're so right. This was very different. If all the marketing, so this is true in every category. It doesn't matter whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, a car dealership, you know, uh, yeah. a management consultant, uh, an architect. I, I can think of all the different categories I run into across the way. Hydraulics, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter what it is, right? But if you use the same words in the same language as everybody else, you just blend in with the pack. You haven't yeah. answered the identity question, which is, well, who are you beyond all that noise, hmm. right? Do you have an identity? And so, in the case of Moose Jaw, um, my research uncovered that's where Al Capone and a number of his cronies would go to hide during the Prohibition. Oh, that's where that history comes in. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so here's what happened. They had a train line. It was the Sioux train line that ran from Chicago, crossed the Canadian border. The last stop is Moose Jaw. At the train station... They had built a network of underground tunnels, okay? Wow. So the gangsters and the thugs could have a nice place to hide bootleg whiskey and rum and immigrants and anything you could think of that you needed to hide. Moose Jaw was the place to do it, and no one would ever know, okay? And then I'll never forget the chief of police in that boot camp session I was telling you about jumping up from his chair 
saying, you know, guys, in 1927, the day shift busted the night shift for corruption. Mm. Like it had this very sketchy past, right? So who's the most famous gangster in the world? Capone. Let's build off that. Let's use that. Tongue in cheek, of course, right? So the essence of, hey, of the Moose Jaw brand of the Notorious City, hey, it's okay to be a little naughty because humans have a little naughty side, right? Yeah, well, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of the things, yeah. all of these things that we really are intrigued by and a lot of it's human nature too, right? And right. it makes me think of too, it's like, what do we all do when we're driving by a an accident? We all rubberneck it, right? right. Because so, it's that that human nature to to want to to check it out, to be curious about oh, what's going on over here. So in my line of work, people always want to know the results, right? And yeah. what, what, because we're in the long term brand building, if you actually create your identity based on who you already are, and we call it the emotional truth. You've got to build it emotional around truth. an emotional truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that term, by the way. I, yeah, yeah. I think we should say that a few times. Emotional truth. That's a great What's term. What's the emotional truth here, right? And, and so, but one of the most gratifying things that happened with the Moose Jaw Project, I got a call from the city manager in January of this year, and I nearly fell off my chair. So, I, I had always known tourism went up 30% in the first year. They had won a number of marketing awards from like the Canadian Municipalities Association. They were, and, and, and the whole Cold War with Norway was just one of a number of initiatives designed to advance the notoriety. We did some other things that really pushed the envelope, right? But hey, we can, if, if we're going to be notorious, guess what? We can play that card, right? Yeah. But I got this call from Jim Pufalt, the city manager. Since they became the notorious city in 2019, just the amount of new economic development projects in Moose Jaw exceeds $1.25 billion. Wow. It represents nearly 1,000 new jobs in a wow. town of 33,000. We said it earlier, April, one story can change the world. Like one story can impact so many people and cause a ripple effect so many ways. It might impact people in a positive manner that have no idea how it was created in the first place. It doesn't matter. The fact is, Moose Jaw is just one of a number of examples that people will discover in the book that reached into its past to repurpose it for a brighter future. And they did it by building it on, a, on an identity that was already theirs. Mm, yeah. Now, Gare, I, I hear so many great things. And some of the key things that I'm, I'm really taking away with this brand identity is that, that story, that passion, that uh, authentic self. And I know that that might be a little overused, but you know, that, that heart center mm. aspect of ourselves, the vulnerable place of ourselves to really just be ourselves and be our business and portray that to everything and everyone around us. And, you know, that is truly what creates the magic of this brand identity and really standing outside of the pack. Now, now from that story, let's talk about your story in your book. You've had it behind in your background and and I love the way that it looks because it definitely looks magical. It looks like, oh my gosh, if I flip through these pages, I'm going to find magic in the contents within. So I can see where you really went with that. And is there anything else that you want to want to play on that? Let's talk a little bit about this beautiful book you you thank wrote you. and you're sharing with the world. Well, thank you. It's it's the culminate. It's my life's work. It's it took four years to write and research it, but it's based on, you know, upwards of 30 some years of experience uh, on the front lines of, of broadcasting and business to arrive at these inescapable conclusions on how legends are created. Um, Dana Zillick, my partner in business life and crime deserves enormous cred for the cover, 
the cover of the book, and I won't give it away, but I will tease people in the sense that the cover of the book also has its own story. And if you look very closely with the symbols, people will be able to figure it out. Um, mm. So the exploding magic book cover, that was Dana's idea. And then we thought the symbols uh, would really add something to it because in chapter eight, we explore the power of symbols and rituals of how the greatest uh, yeah. brands in the world and how legends leverage symbols and rituals. And, and, and so uh, you're in the state of Texas, right? I am. Yeah. So at this moment. Yeah. So the story <laughs> in the state of Texas changed dramatically uh, back in the mid 80s when um, a certain four word story started popping up all over the place called Don't Mess With Texas. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big well, thing. We see it all over. Yeah. Well, we tracked down the guy who created that. And now 38 years in, it's still a phenomenal piece of work. Tim McClure, great friend of mine out of Austin, Texas. But Tim also went through the same things that we're talking about. He too had to display great emotional courage to help bring that story to life, mm. all right? Don't mess with Texas isn't a jingle or a slogan or a tagline. It's a battle cry. It's an anthem, right? Yeah. So that's the story part. Symbols and rituals, I just happen to have one here. I mean... This has worked very, very well for the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but it's a symbol, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And yet, every time they play home or away, you will see the vast majority of the crowd. Even the other day, they were playing in Los Angeles. I'm sure 40 to 45% of the audience were, wearing, were waving terrible towels. So there's a lot to unpack in the study of legends their origins, why they have enduring appeal. And to circle back to where we started, to me, they represent the things that will never change. A thousand years from now, I'm willing to bet that people will still be fascinated by the words of Sir Winston Churchill, we shall not flag or fail, yeah. right? I, I believe FDR and the New Deal, those words, at the fireside chat, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. There, there's a reason why the words of Shakespeare are still relevant more than 500 years later. Why? Because they're tapping into the things about us as humans. Mm, that soul level. At the yeah. soul level. If it wasn't good, it wouldn't still be around. The Beatles are still going to be relevant 100 years from now. Yeah, because that's our core and our essence, you know, and right. they're, they're timeless things that, that we're talking about here. And, and I think that so, so many of us um, are able to really tap into that and just recycle it and be able to say it maybe said differently for the times, right? But in its essence, it's the same thing because it is our internal essence. Right. And if you're a small to medium sized business and you can tap into that energy, now you've changed the playing field. And it might I think Ryan Holiday is a really great example of that, actually, when it when he has brought back so much historical right. wisdom. Yeah, and, and we're I, I think in many respects, uh Ryan and I are are just mining the same source, but kind of in a different fashion, if you yeah. will. Right. Yeah. But but that to me is what it comes down to. I think if people are serious about building a brand and having, you know the capacity to attract significant market share to me it all starts with identity first and then you build reputation yeah oh well gare it has been so awesome to have you on the show and i i truly love your book i want to make sure that the audience knows where to find you knows where to find your book I've had it displayed throughout. It's also going to be in the description below. So whether you're tuning in or you're watching uh, with your eyes here on the Wellness Driven Life Show, the website is www.garemaxwell.com. That's G-A-I-R-M-A-X-W-E-L-L. -L. 
Com. I also want to invite people to engage in this conversation. It doesn't matter whether you've tuned in now, and thank you so much for those of you who have commented, but leave your comments in the comments section below after this has been played, because I, I know that Gare is going to want to know your ideas and your takeaways from this, and as do I. Gare, share with me. What are some of the things that you are going to be continuing to grow with? What's the next big thing for you? Oh, <laughs> geez, I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. You got me. Um, but the next big thing besides, uh, you know, uh, serving our, our growing community and client base around different parts of North America and the world, actually, is I want to tackle another subject. Um, and I want to explore how to create modern day legacy. Mm. So Big Little Legends is the book about brands, how to build irresistible brands. The next book is about how do we create modern day legacy in a day when, in a day and age where newspapers are disappearing, as are encyclopedias, a lot of the 20th century models for preserving history are gone or will yeah. disappear, right? And yeah. and so families, for example, have kept scrapbooks and photo albums for years, right? And and I'm interested now in in today's day and age, because I have grandchildren, and and I want to know, okay, what do you do now to keep the stories alive, whether it's three, four, five, six generations down the road? Yeah. So we've, um, and I, I would never have connected the dots and I had no plan, but it was just this instinct that the spidey sense, um, I had to capture my father's story. And that story has now been documented uh, on YouTube. It's an 11 and a half minute documentary. It's uh, ESPN 30 for 30 style. My dad is a former professional golfer who was born seven minutes from the first tee in St. Andrew, Scotland. And mm -hmm. I didn't fully really understand his story until I went there in 2016. Anyway, my father is now 84 years old. Uh, he's having some health issues, especially with his memory and, uh, and you know, dementia and uh, things of that nature. But he is the only former pro golfer in the history of the world to have competed in a four generational foursome, five years in a row. Wow. No one else has ever done this. And so that's when we preserve that story and put it together, that's where I got to thinking, I think legacy is the next subject I'm going to explore because mm. I don't know that anyone else is looking at that subject through that lens, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so pleased that I asked you that question. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense with a father who has done something that nobody else has to have, you know, birthed from that you and all of the things that you're out there creating and the insights that you're really curious about and questioning and bringing out to us. So thank you so much. You've been an absolute incredible guest here on the Wellness Driven Life Show. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience today? Uh, I just, uh, I, well, first of all, thank you. You're very generous. I'm so grateful for the invitation. If I can put out one plug, uh, it would be for our series. It's Leaders and Legends. You can go to the website and that's how people stay uh, ahead, of the, uh, ahead of the curve, so to speak, because we publish, we only publish once a month on Leaders and Legends because I don't want to fill everyone's inbox, hmm. right? We want to be respectful. Um, but that being said, uh, like the last post is that is a deeper dive on Taylor Swift and the Mona Lisa effect that you alluded to earlier. And inside our archives, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, incredibly rich resources that people can dig into. And the beauty of the Internet is that it's so easy to find and subscribe to that kind of material. Right. And we, so we just want to be a resource uh, to help other people who are as equally curious about. Uh, the origin of legends and why people find them so fascinating. Oh, I love that. I Again, 
Garrett, it has truly been an honor to have you on the Wellness Driven Life Show. We'll have to have you back because I know that we could just dive a lot deeper on this subject. So uh, stay tuned, everyone, because I think that that's something that we're going to do in the future. Uh, you've been awesome. You have so much wisdom to share with everyone. And I love how we've gone so much more deeper and, and you know, with, with the heart of the matter of the things that truly do matter. So again, thank you, Gare, for being our guest on the Wellness Driven Life Show. Again, Pleasure everyone. Yep. Happy to do it again. Ah, awesome. Awesome. Well, the answer is there. Wonderful. Um, again, everybody, you know where to find him. You can find it in the description below. Be sure to leave your comments also in the comment section and we will get back to you. Thank you so much for all of you who are tuning in to the show. Without you, we couldn't do what we're doing and be able to share the beautiful insight and guests that we have on the show. So all that being said, thank you so much and goodbye for now. <laughs>